hi, I'm Will. And as I say here, I promise web accessibility compliance is interesting. <laughs> I want to talk about why it's interesting. A lot of people think compliance is one of those things you need to tick when you get to a certain point to move on to the next level. It's a requirement. It's not something you want to do. But compliance is interesting because it helps you get users. We're going to talk about what it is, why you should care, and I'm going to talk about how you get it once you do care. I'm going to show some live examples, real numbers on how it affects businesses, actual ways you can fix this depending on your budget, and then at the end I'm going to talk just a little bit about me and my services for anyone who cares. So, I'm Will Slater, founder of Slater Marketing, uh, and we're a marketing consultancy firm that specializes in working with B2B SaaS companies, more specifically startups. But I'm also a speaker and a disabled advocate. Uh, a few years ago, I had uh, two quite large brain surgeries, and after them, I had lost uh, movement in my left leg and had to relearn how to walk and proper control with my fingers on my left side, my entire hand. And the big thing that I realized, yes, I had to learn to walk again. That was annoying. Uh, yes, motivation, struggle, all of that. But the big thing for my work was I realized that the web was unusable now because I couldn't type properly, because I couldn't move my mouse accurately. There were a load of websites and softwares I just would not use. There was impairment to my vision. So some people, they build their website, they think they're being clever, they build with view width instead of a specific font size. So when you zoom in, everything remains exactly the same. So keep zooming, keep zooming, and I still can't see it. Software companies that did that wouldn't get my business. I got to a point where I wouldn't sign up on any software. I couldn't just click sign up with Google on uh, because things that seem easy to do for normal people, click the sign up button, read the description, check out the pricing page, fill out this contact form are not easy for everyone. And I think we get into a bit of a bias about it because obviously in software, SaaS specifically, and in startups, we're a pretty young crowd. Um, there's, I mean, obviously that's a, a wide range, but you see a lot of people who are of perfect health in their 20s and 30s in the SaaS community who this isn't going to cross their mind because it's just not the sort of thing that they come across. The internet felt like the password game, and that's a problem when that's your target user. Now, my problem was temporary. For most people, it isn't. The World Health Organization believes that 2.2 billion people worldwide have a visual impairment, and half of them are predicted to be untreated. One in six people are predicted to be classified as disabled. So that thing I was talking about before with not being able to hit buttons, not being able to see it properly, that's not a small subset of your audience. That is mass, and it's something you will miss entirely unless you're working directly with them or somebody calls you out on it and you don't want to find out when somebody calls you out. I hear this a lot when I speak with people about compliance. Startup Source is a B2B SaaS community, right? So is there any chance your average buyers between the age of 35 to 65, possibly older? Are you surprised that physical disability is twice as high in that age bracket? and visual impairment is three times higher. So those numbers I gave you before, if you're targeting enterprise software, if the people who are making the buying decision on whether to use you are of a slightly older age bracket, the chances that this is a problem for them are so much higher in a way that you're just not gonna consider. Also goes beyond the human element in that search engines factor accessibility in rankings. And this has become more and more prevalent in most recent years. Um, from what we hear from some SEO people, it goes up and up in priority in rankings um, every year on the review. Because obviously we don't know exactly what the SEO, uh, what the ranking algorithms Google use are, but we know accessibility is a factor and we know it seems to be rising as if you check highest search results, the most popular terms, they will be the accessible versions of websites. If you have the same article as somebody below, 
if they are identical, but yours is accessible and theirs isn't, you win. Now, anyone who's interested in this in America is going to ask about the tax side of things. And I want to just cover this quickly. Uh, there are two compliance standards worldwide. Uh, the Web Accessibility, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines and the ADA, American with Disabilities Act. Um, these both cover extremely similar regions and topics, uh, but um, they vary in very slight ways. Chances are, if you comply with one, you're complying with the other. Now, for American companies with less, with less than 1 million in annual revenue and less than 30 employees, compliance with the ADA entitles you to cover 50% of your accessibility-related expenses, you see the kind there, through the Disabled Access Tax, tax Credit for a maximum credit of $5,000 a year. Now, the reason I bring this up before I go any further is just that those apply to expenses incurred by implementing accessibility. So if you're already doing accessibility implementation, absolutely. If you fit those parameters, claim it, but it's not gonna be the reason you should do it. A lot of people think of accessibility as some special category. There's your website and then there's making it work for disabled people. But that's not the way it should work. That's not really how it works at all. Because disability and well-abled, are they're not a dividing line. They are a sliding scale. Um, there are a lot of people who don't know that they have impairments or untreated. Uh, people who are a little bit disabled, but mostly able to function like me, like normal people, like me. Um, and then there are people who just have no awareness on where they are on that scale. People who wouldn't classify themselves as disabled, but are affected by the exact same things. What makes you compliant is also what optimizes your website for user experience. The easier it is for people to find, navigate your website, decide if they're a customer and then bounce or opt in, the easier it is for you to generate leads and revenue. And if your website, knowingly or otherwise, is turning away 20% of people because of some kind of disability or problem with, visual, with the visuals that make it hard to see, that's a problem you need to solve, accessibility or not. When it comes to accessibility on the web, there are two ways to do this. Um, one of them is alternate sites, um, and that is using certain type of software where you install a piece of tracking code on your website. Uh, and as a result, when it detects screen readers, when it detects visual impairment and auditory impairment assisted devices like Chrome extensions that do those jobs, uh, it reformats the HTML and the code of your website to make it perfectly readable for them. If you do that on its own, technically you are compliant, but that on its own isn't what's going to help the rest of your users who don't consider themselves to be disabled or don't use assistive devices. So that first one is design. Um, and I like it when people take an approach where they do both things. The first one is the hardest. Designing your site might take some redesigns. It may take changing the way you currently do things. Uh, and that strides a lot of people away. But if you do it right, you can tie it into ease of access and see a direct impact on revenue by doing so. Uh, the software is good too, because doing it all with just design is very hard. There's no way around that. There's a reason software that does this exists, and there's a reason people pay for it, because it can be difficult. Um, ideally, you do both, but if the aim of the game is to make our websites more accessible for disabled people, something is better than nothing. So let's go through a few ways that companies handle implementing. If you're a big company, you pay a consulting firm that specializes in accessibility compliance, and you pay them a lot of money to go through, audit your entire website and software. Remember, you can make your front end landing page compliant, but if your software itself is unusable, then the same problem applies. Um, 
that can be very expensive because you're paying for a design agency as well as compliance experts, as well as the audit. The pricing on that range is quite, quite wide, depending on how many pages you have, the complexity of your software. Um, it's a good option if you want a hands-free approach, but it's not usually people's default. If you want a more budget conscious way of doing that, you get somebody to do an audit, then you take the advice from that audit and you implement it. You probably have a web designer on your team. Maybe you design your website yourself, or you just kind of have a go-to guy for it. Uh, and mix with the software that I was talking about that we'll get to examples of in a second. You're able to meet compliance on both sides, making your website design more accessible for people and having compliance software that handles special um, categories like um, screen readers and such. This is how you fix this, the, the investments coming any day now, I swear, startup way, um, which is where you use one of the softwares like Accessibility or Equal Web, there's Accessi Way. Um, there's multiple players in the market. There are about as 80, they're about 85% as good as a human's eye, but the cost is about $49 a month. Then using yourself or your web designer, you can these generate audit reports on exact problems that they're coming across. So you install the software to handle special categories and then using a web designer, follow the guidance and make the changes. If somebody's interested in this, I have an affiliate link or you can just Google it. I'm not your mum. Finally, there are really early stage companies who love the idea of making their website more accessible for disabled people. They have no idea how they're going to be able to afford to do that. And then we can use elements like uh, Accessibility provide free scans so that you can get a look at specific pages of your website, get a list of problems, and then try and fix them yourself. It's not easy, but it's better than nothing. And then use software like Hotjar or other visual inspection software to see how people are interacting with your website, see where they're struggling. It's one thing to optimize for finding the right pages for people, but if you can tell people don't even know how to use your website, there's a problem and you can fix it. And that's good for accessibility, but it's also good for revenue. Quick disclaimer, uh, obviously it's a software, they're selling something, the only one I've ever seen them say whether accessibility is compliant is their own through that free scan. But it's a to-do list. It's better than nothing. Now, I want to hop out of the presentation for a bit and give this a live try. Um, obviously, this is a meeting with just me. So you're looking at this on a recording. But we're going to test it out with some popular SaaS and see the kind of results we get because less people than you think are compliant. Let's start off with one of the biggest software companies that we are probably all looking at. HubSpot.com, semi-compliant. Because yes, their elements with button functionally should be tagged for assistive technology. Yes, they don't have any empty links or empty buttons, but links that open in new tabs and new windows aren't tagged for assistive technology. So if you're using a screen reader, if you're visually impaired, links need to be tagged in a special way because if a link opens in a new tab, that's a wrench in a screen reader that the screen reader doesn't know how to understand. Somebody clicks a button, nothing happens. They don't know why. The screen reader doesn't know why because it doesn't have the context. And that person's continuing to read, thinking they just clicked a button that's supposed to be taking them to the next level. Wow. Interactive elements should be navigable using the keyboard. Links, buttons, and form fields. Say you're like me and you had issues with uh, dexterity, uh, with shaky hands, uh, trying to navigate between different forms, different, uh, <laughs> different input areas on a form. Um, extremely difficult. If the website allows you to just use your arrow keys 
to select the next one and move on down, then that is disability compliant. It's little things we don't think about, but if you don't have it, then you're making your website harder to use the people who need to use it. And I'm sure you can imagine something like that being navigable using your keyboard. That's not that disability specific. There are just some people who are not very good with a mouse or a pad and would find that much easier. Menu drop downs aren't tagged. If you use mega menus on your website, watch out. You need to have things properly tagged because obviously mega menus, great for us. I use them myself, but if they're not tagged properly, they are a mess of screen readers. It's just a wall of text that it doesn't understand. Makes your website completely unusable for a regular person. Wow. Font sizes. HubSpot doesn't use big enough fonts on lots of places, which means people either need to use artificial external tools to enhance the size of the font, or they just need to adjust their glasses, hoping that they can read it. Or if they can't read it, they go and they go pick Zoho instead. This is HubSpot, one of the biggest SaaS companies in the world, but they're not alone. I know we're just picking CRMs here, but why not while we're at it? Salesforce is compliant. Now, there is a chance that Salesforce is compliant because they use accessibility. I'd have to check that. But even this, even though they are compliant, there are specific things that they are failing on. They have got enough enforced to be considered compliant, but it's still not perfect. There's elements of the code for aren't tagged properly so a screen reader doesn't know whether they should be reading them or opening them nine successful three failed not bad salesforce not bad how about startupsource.com <laughs> oh. <laughs> i mean it's built with kajabi right so Maybe they've implemented something to do that themselves. I mean, I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> Semi compliant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not bad. It's... So it's the same kind of little things on tagging, on text uh -huh. labels, the headings, the assistive technology. So, Oof. yeah, titles being built as text tags. So instead of being tagged as a header, it's just a big font, um, wow. which means that if you've got a big header and then a body of text underneath it, which that's every website, every single one of us uses, um, for a screen reader, instead of reading that as headline information, it will just read straight through it like it's a wall of text because it can't tell the difference between them. Oh. Hidden links that allow skipping blocks, objects and embedded text of images should be described. So obviously every image on your website, we all know when we've been there in WordPress and we upload a new file to our media gallery and we just, it says, do you want to put a description or a tag on that? And then you just double click as quickly as possible so that you don't have to deal with it. But that makes it harder for, nor for people who use uh, accessibility tools to access. Oh. Now, I was going to walk through with a screen reader on this exact thing, trying to try a few more websites to see how it reads. But I don't think there's any point because if HubSpot aren't meeting the compliance standards, feel free to go. Accessibility.com backslash access scan. It will be, I'm sure in the email sent out, there'll be a link and you can try it out yourself on your website and find out whether you're compliant, semi-compliant or just not compliant. Um, I'll go back into finishing off the slideshow because fixing this, as you see, there's a bit of work to be done. And some of those things are practical, like writing in descriptions to your images. And some of them are bigger, like optimizing for screen readers. And you may prioritize different parts of that. 
yes, no one's compliant, but that's your opportunity. If you're trying to figure out how you get your new article for your competitor article ranked, ranked above uh, your biggest competitor on Google, and you know your article's as good as theirs, and you have pretty much as many backlinks, and you're not sure how you're going to get across the line, this is another area that you can be just slightly better than them so that you can win. And the same applies in terms of accessibility. If people are picking between your software and they visit your website and your competitor's website and they are a disabled person and they think both of your websites and software, they look pretty similar. I can't work out what's better about the two of them, but your website is easy for them to use and easy for them to sign up and the other ones isn't they will use you. People, even, even pricing, um, people assume people for software, they either go for the best or they go for the cheapest, but people really do have preferential uh, choices. Um, many people don't move software, not because they think their current one's the best, but because it's the one they feel most comfortable using. And yes, that comes in time and knowledge and amount of experience with it. But the other way is to make them feel welcomed when they come in. If they find your website easy to use and your software easy to use, then people will have to really undercut and really over deliver to beat you to steal that customer away from you. The biggest mistakes people make on this is thinking it's a one-time project. Really what it is, is yes, it's software and that's great, but it's also training yourself and your web designers to think about this as you go. If a website doesn't have descriptions on images, then that's a problem. Chances are that's not a single image. That's all of your images or 90% of them or half of them. And you need to make sure that your web developers are up to date on that. You need to think about things when you're designing a new page, a landing page for a specific industry, you're asking yourself, okay, this is great. Could my grandma read this? Because if she couldn't, then it doesn't work for everyone. It's little thought processes like that that make it difficult. So having a long-term plan on what you and your staff should be doing so that you don't fall back into bad habits makes this easier to sustain. And at the end of the day, it will help you get more customers and generate more revenue. Summary, this affects user experience, so it affects lead generation, so it affects customer acquisition, so it affects revenue. And it's really not that hard to solve. I've provided an option to solve it at every budget, which means you should make it a priority, even if it's not something you really care about. It's something that matters to your business. It's something that will help you. Questions? That was great, Will. That was really, really great. Um, so I do have a couple of questions that people have sent through. Um, one of them was, um, so there's a lot of everything now with AI and everything, there's a, a big legal aspect that people are always considering. So if you, what are the legal repercussions of not being compliant for a SaaS company? Sure. So this does vary based on geography. Um, and this does vary based on um, industry because if you're a healthcare SaaS Obviously, people are going to be a bit more strict about these kind of things working with you than if you're providing for construction or accounting or anything like that. Um, but the downsides are uh, people who feel that they've been missold or that they haven't got the right information or that their website led them to something else can claim and sue because they said that your website wasn't accessible enough and it caused problems. Now, this gets very big if you're a company that goes beyond SaaS. If you're a company that ties into services and physical locations. Suits can go past the cost they paid, but the cost of their time, the cost of their company's time and implementation. Imagine your software costs $1,000 a month and you sell a client and you realize three months down the line after they'd spent $3,000 and about $15,000 of their cost of their uh, team's time training on it, $15,000 each month because they've got a 10 man team and they spent lots of time training all these people. 
they come back to you and say, I didn't understand what I read. Your website wasn't clear. It wasn't accessible. I'm going to file a suit against you because of that. The question becomes, are they going to win? In some places, yes, it's happened. In the United States, definitely, yes, it has happened. Because this goes beyond just accessibility. This is about the cost of their time, the cost of their company's time, um, and then feeling like they were sold the wrong bill of goods because of a lack of understanding. With softwares that I mentioned like Accessibility, many of them include legal cover. So Accessibility give, gives up to a million dollars a year uh, in cut. No, not a million dollars, a million dollars in cover. So if you were sued, there's built in insurances there so that it's not coming directly out of your pocket. Um, so if this is something you were looking to implement because you're worried about long term legal aspects, so a software like that provides more than just accessibility. It provides coverage for you and your company. Awesome. Um, and then well, with in terms of like everything is AI these days, how do you see how is AI impacting compliance? Like are there tools that utilize well, there are obviously tools that utilize AI, but I know a lot of people are integrating AI into their um, chatbots and things like that. And how does that relate to, to compliance? Sure. Uh, an interesting one. I, I'd say the biggest thing is, at the end of the day, the outputs that they get are images and texts, video from AI. Um, and as far as those go, depending on the AI, because Claude and OpenAI and Gemini will handle this differently, some of them produce results that are auto-tagged with accessibility information, and some of them don't. And if your SaaS incorporates a large amount of AI generation, it's probably open up open AI at this point, uh, and you're probably using it for copy, um, text, then you need to ask yourself, is there a potential of tying right back into that lawsuit because it's generating copy that people can't read um, and don't have access to? Uh, I'd say, Yes, it's implemented in the software that people use, like AI is helping understand websites and um, restructure them, like the ones I mentioned, equal way, accessibility, access away. Their AI, they use AI to rewrite the code of your website to restructure it for screen readers and accessibility. Um, but when you're implementing AI and you're uh, into your business, you need to ask yourself the outputs of that software. Is that also accessible? Because obviously that's changing what your SaaS looks like and what it does day to day. You need to make sure that, um, yeah, that the outputs are good. Uh, a very long winded way of saying, yes, it affects things. Um, I'd say keep your eyes on it for sure. Uh, and it's something you really want to monitor and have somebody who is monitoring because obviously that changes when video starts to come in. If AI is generating video, should AI be generating captions for it? If AI is generating images, are those images, do they have meta descriptions for screen readers and such? Um, the more the AI grows and the more it's able to create, the more we need to make sure we're implementing it in a way that it's also creating things that can be used by disabled people and people with special assistive needs. Awesome. Um, and then the last question I had, you, you touched on it just in terms of um, uh, accessibility being being prioritized by Google, but what other SEO um, advantages does it have, if any, like to how to be compliant um, apart from Google? Sure. So as far as SEO advantages, um, Yes, it raises your domain authority. Um, many believe that to be true. Remember, with Google, we're always guessing a little bit because if they told us exactly how their algorithm worked, this whole thing wouldn't work. Um, but we know that it affects domain authority. Um, so that means your backlinks are worth more. The sort of value of your site's worth more. Uh, we know it affects individual page ranking. Um, if you're accessible, the same quality of website page Somebody who's not, you're going to come first, assuming all other factors are the same. Um, 
And beyond just SEO, there's that thing. I don't know if everyone does this, but I do. If I'm Googling for a result, I grab that mouse and middle click on the top three results so I can compare. Um, there are plenty of people who check a few results before they pick something. And it ties right back into if they pick your one, even if you are ranked below the other person, but they can understand yours and they can't understand theirs, you win. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Um, the last question I wanted to ask, um, have you seen what kind of percentage? Okay, so let me, let me phrase it to you like this. Have you seen businesses or examples where the business or where the SaaS wasn't compliant and then they implemented a few strategies and then became compliant and that it affected their, their sign up rates? And what kind of percentage? I know it's hard to talk about percentages, but just to kind of get an idea of what they didn't have and then what they suddenly did have due to accessibility. Sure, it's a great question. Um, I think there's a two levels to that one because if you just implement the software and you just have that alternative option for screen readers and such, you probably won't see an immediate difference. You'll see an uptick in... Uh, traffic, uh, you'll see your bounce rates decrease a little bit. Uh, it's measurable, but it's not life-changing. When people overhaul their website to be accessible, and I can give uh, an example with this, um, when you overhaul your entire website to be accessible in terms of how it looks and how it acts for everyone, you're not just making your website better for disabled people, you're making it better for everybody who lands on it. And that's when you see bounce rates drop 10, 15 percent, percent. that's when you see uh, retention go up. That's when you see people more likely to interact, to read, and more likely to convert by the very nature of that. Uh, I recently did it with a software company in Glasgow that's in the prop tech industry. Um, I haven't got their prior approval to say their name on this, so I will think about that one and decide if I'm going to. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I did a compliance audit for them. I went through, I redesigned their website. I'll be honest with you, it needed a redesign anyway. Um, so one could just say I made a better website, but I think that ties right in. Um, and their lead generation... Theirs is entirely inbound. They work with a fairly low paid spend on Facebook. They were doing about 30 leads a month without increasing budget, without increasing traffic. The very next month and the next month after that was 42. Wow. That's a 25% increase. Whether that's going to scale to a company currently doing 1,000 and whether they're going to go to 1,250, I couldn't say for sure. But it's been proven time and time again that the easier website is to use the longer people stay, the more convert. It just ties right in. Yeah, that's true. I'm thinking about like websites that I found too complicated and I was like, no, I'm out, goodbye. So it's very true to say. Yeah, it, I, I think we all do it. We Sometimes we don't notice it, but if you get to a website that's very dense, text heavy, or just doesn't have the pages you're looking for, you bounce. Um, and... You know, the most common user journey for any website is uh, for any B2B SaaS is that they land on the home page, they look at the hero section, and then they click the pricing button. That is universal. Um, but it's the reason some companies choose to exclude pricing sections altogether um, because they think that's going to help. But it doesn't help. It's just an indication that Users know what they want. They don't like being told what to do or where to go. They hate closed box landing pages. If you look at the numbers on them, over 95% bounce rates, much higher. Average on-page time, three seconds or less, even if you filter out bot traffic. People hate going to a website where they can tell they're locked in. So if you can design your website in a way that anybody can land on it and find the information they're looking for themselves, then you are developing the optimal experience. And that's on the accessibility side, but that's just in general biz, uh, B2B SaaS uh, website practices. Um, yeah. Bounce rates aren't a bad thing, but you want bounce rates from people who looked at your software and went, that's not for me. You don't want bounce rates from your ideal audience who just can't work it out. 
Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. You hit the nail on the head with that one. So, well, again, thanks so much for this. If people want to get in contact with you, um, tell me a little bit more. You said you do Slater Marketing. Tell me a little bit more about what you guys are offering um, and sure. how people can get in contact with you. I will obviously send out contact details, everything by email. I just wanted to give you a, a chance to to explain. <laughs> to Absolutely. My chance to plug. Yeah. This is me. Me and my team specialize in helping B2B SaaS startups implement systems that generate leads, systems that nurture leads, and optimize their processes for closing the deal. Um, we're not a paper lead agency. That's not our structure. What we mean when we say that is we want to build you a system that works so that you can keep using it. If you keep us on board, you're keeping us on board to build the next system, not to get rid of the old one, not to maintain it. We work with a lot of people. These are clients we've worked with in the last year across Australia, the Middle East, um, North Africa, Europe, and the United States and Canada, well, North America, let's use that term. Uh, all B2B SaaS, because that's the only thing we do. And we help B2B SaaS companies at every stage. There's a Y Combinator startup on the last slide. So, you know, have fun Googling. Um, who want to grow faster and they don't know what they need to do next. We help those companies grow faster and know what's next. Practical revenue generation. It's all we do. If you're looking for a new logo, we're not the people to call. If you want to go from 10K a month in MRR to 20, and you really don't know what's coming next to make that happen, I'm probably the person to speak to. Nice. Awesome. All. Can people get awesome. in contact with the, just the question, sorry, can people get in contact with you with the email that's, that I have for you? Is that the, uh, are you happy for me to send that email out to everyone? Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, my LinkedIn is on that screen, but if somebody wants to just uh, reach out via email, well, it's slatermarketing.co.uk because we're a British company, so that's always confuses people. Uh, and uh, That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've seen some interesting things written. Um, <laughs> True that. Awesome. 